be. I guess that's it. Ready? Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. If you would, we're going to be studying the office of the bishop. We're studying uh, Timothy. We're at Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. We're going through the book of Timothy. And if you would read with me uh, before we get into the study of the bishop, let's see something very important. 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2, verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for the masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. Now, that's very important to understand as we get into studying the bishop. And I'll try to give you a little something... Um, that I just uh, received some information on in a news feed. Interesting uh, thing. Uh, construction of religious buildings in the U.S. has fallen to the lowest level in any time since private records began in 1967. Religious groups will build an estimated 10.3 billion square feet this year, down 8% from 2013. Now, this is shocking and 80% since construction peaked in 2002, according to the Dodge date uh, at analytics. So what they're telling you is this. They started keeping records on church construction building and the square feet they built in 1967. It continued to increase to 2002. Then, since then, it's dropped 80%. Now, you have to be very careful. Uh, we do these things, and we may be in error, but I think there's a correlation. It was the very next year, in 2003, that um, the Texas case took place in the Supreme Court that opened the door to the um, sodomite rights that we've experienced. And if you take my... Bible study that I gave you on Romans on Sunday night and we went through that because we were in Romans 123 and those verses when a man's sins get to the sodomite level God gives them up as a reprobate there's a big misunderstanding with Christians and it's this when we deal with salvation, all sins are the same because if you break one law, you're guilty of all, and you need to repent and receive forgiveness of your sin nature of your sins. But all sins in life and reality are not the same. The Bible says of the Sodomites that they were sinners exceedingly. And it's this. Under the law, adultery was a death sentence. God considered that sin so heinous that it was worthy of death. And Leviticus says, the man and the woman, they both shall die. But when you go to homosexuality, you go beyond lust and the sentence of death. Now your sentence can't increase anymore. You can't, you can't kill somebody twice. But you're depraved. You've gone from lust, worthy of death, to depravity, worthy of death, and the sin is exceeding. Uh, Jesus said, um, the individual that, and that would have been the priest, that turned him over to Pilate, had the greater sin. And so, there's some type of irrational comprehension in the church where people think all sins are the same. A common sense will tell you all sins are not. We're dealing with repentance to salvation. That's one thing. But when we're dealing with life and our daily walk, well, how much would you be offended if somebody stole a penny from you? I got a jar of pennies. I go over there and just bring them over and throw them out. You could all have them. I could care less. You steal a hundred bucks from me, I'm going to be a little sore. Steal a thousand, I'm going to be a little upset. <laughs> Ten thousand, you're destroying my life. I mean, that's just common sense, folks. 
There are far serious and far lesser sins in life, and they have a great effect on our life. Now, here we have, Therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. If any man also strive for the masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. Now here's the thing that's important. The pastor, the man that's striving to be a pastor, evangelist, has to strive lawfully according to God's word, according to God's laws and God's precepts and God's truth, not the world's. Right there he said you don't entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. Now what I'm saying is this. I am probably, and many other faithful pastors to the word of God are going to become criminals in the next few years if the Lord tarries. Pastors are already criminals in, um, in um, Canada if they teach God's word faithfully. If they teach and denounce sodomy, they're being held by, uh, to a, a hate crime. It's coming here to America. Now you're going to have to make a decision. Are you a Christian? Are you a follower of the Lamb? Am I a soldier of the cross? A follower? I'm a follower of the Lamb. I don't care if they turn me into a criminal. Sodomy is a sin worthy of death, and it's wrong. And if they turn me into a criminal, I'm going to jail. Now, most Christians are going to start wilting. Not me. You go. Okay, it's your choice. But I'm striving for a crown. An incorruptible crown. Every Christian should be. You can strive for the crowns too. Qualifications for a bishop. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop... He desireth a good work. The passage deals with the qualifications of a bishop called by three titles in the Word of God. Those titles given by the Word of God are pastor, overseer, and bishop. Now, the term pastor is only found one time in the Bible, and that's in the book of Jeremiah. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. Neither have I desired the woeful day that thou knowest that which came out of my lips was right before thee. Jeremiah took the title of being a pastor. And the humble man of God takes that title. He can also be called an overseer and a bishop. They deal with his authority and his leadership. But the pastor deals with his humility in the ministry to this. He didn't desire the woeful day. Okay? He did not desire any of one's hurt. God says himself, I am not willing that any should perish. However, God will enact his justice and God will be sending multitudes to hell. He is not desiring to do that. And I've given it to you over and over again. It would be a good picture to set in your mind so you'll see God's judgment and why he gives people over to a reprobate mind and why he enacts his justice and he will send millions, probably billions of souls to an eternal damnation. It's because when people get ravaged with sin, it, like leprosy, grows and the depravity grows and the mind becomes a reprobate, and the man becomes almost unredeemable. Now, I wouldn't say unredeemable because at any time that a person's breathing, they can repent of all their sins and get saved. But the more they pursue their sin, the more they harden their heart to the gospel, the less and less their chances of getting saved are. That's why most people that get saved get saved before the age of 25. Now, Walter, Walter is an amazement and a wonderment for a man. Walter was 50 years of age when he got saved. 
God did an amazing thing. A good man. And God saved him. But you won't find too many people getting saved at that age anymore. It's because people have become hardened and embittered and, um, to the things of God. Sad. And that's the way it is when people become worse and worse sinners. They become hardened. And that's the fact of life. Now, it's important because a pastor is given authority. Those men that are humble, I don't like to be called reverend. I do not like to be called a bishop. And I don't like to be called um, an overseer. I prefer to be called pastor. I am an overseer. I am a bishop. And the title reverend, I'll use it for God's glory because the lost world wants you to be a reverend. And if you're not a reverend, then well, you can't be a minister. So, okay, I'm a reverend then. But don't ever, don't call me rever, reverend. I don't appreciate that. Holy and reverend is his name. God is reverend. Not as men. We can be holy men of God, but we're, we're flesh. It's God that's holy and reverent. But I'm not going to um, also be abused by unwise Christians. If you go to my desk, I think you'll see there's a thing that says REV period in my name. And when I sign marriage certificates and things like that, I sign reverend. When I sign official things, when I sign over the years, all the times we went into debt uh, when we were building the church, the first church, bought the house, bought a signed reverend. Okay? But you guys should call me pastor. Because I should pastor you in humility. Now Paul speaks about this. What is my reward then? 1 Corinthians 9.18 Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Revealing the humble restraint not to abuse that power to speak on behalf of God in spiritual matters. What you need to understand, and now this is very important, because this is not in hardly any of the churches of God today at all. The church is not a republic. The church is not a democracy. The church is not an oligarchy. The church is not any form of worldly government. A Bible-believing church is a spiritual theocracy. Israel was a national and political theocracy. The local church is a spiritual theocracy, or it's not God's church. Say, so what do you mean? Well, whose church is this? Does this church belong to the members of Calvary Bible Baptist Church? No. Does this church belong to the pastor? No. Not if it's God's church. Look at Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. If this is a Bible-believing church, it belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen. The church is then a spiritual government of a body of believers, not a state as Israel. Nonetheless, it is under the immediate direction of God. Through the scriptures, and not the will of the people or the will of the pastor, but the authority of the word of God. Then Pilate entered in the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered and, said, uh, answered and said, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? When the Lord returns, both the state theocracy of Israel and the spiritual theocracy of the church will come under the monarchy of Jesus Christ. Now that's very important for you to understand because what we're talking about is authority. And authority amongst believers in Christ today 
is at an all-time low. The body of Christ, for the most part, is in rebellion to the head of the church, Jesus Christ. Because both pastors and congregations have usurped their needful submission to the word of God. And if you're not in submission to the word of God, you may or may not be saved. That's between you and God. But you're not right with God. You're not walking in the spirit. You cannot walk in the spirit in disobedience to your Lord and Savior. Now, I believe a saved man can do anything that a lost man can do as far as sinning. Because he's got an old nature. He's got the old flesh. But if he wants to please his heavenly father and he wants to belong to God's church then he has to be in submission to God now you all got a copy of the constitution right in your hands read it and the truth shall make you free One of the things that was said to me by several reprobates when we had our church problems was, well, they're not your people. Oh, because I look at you as my people. If I've led you to the Lord and you're allowing me to minister to you, then I look to you as my people. I mean, most of the people that were in my church, I want them to Christ. So Paul said that Timothy was his son and Lord. But then I can agree with that. Then um, if... You're going to say that you're not my people, then you're God's people. And if somebody takes you from God's church, they just stole God's people. And that ain't a good situation to be in. That's not being lawful. That's what goes on a lot today in America, is there's hardly any church growth at all due to soul winning. Most any place where churches are growing all, they're stealing somebody else's members. That's what's going on today in America. Now, most pastors won't say anything about that because most pastors are stealing other people's members <laughs> or hoping to steal other people's members because they want to grow. Now, you know it's been the policy of this pastor. And here's how you do it rightly, how you do it lawfully. If somebody comes from another Bible-believing church to this church because they have something that they're not right with with their pastor, your pastor does not accept them as a church member or takes them in. Your pastor requires that they, and if necessary, he will go with them back to their original pastor to see if we can restore the breach. You know what it says in the Old Testament about a man of God? He's a restorer of the breach. In other words, a man of God is godly. He doesn't take advantage as an opportunist over a bad situation. He tries to heal it and make it right because he's good and he's godly. Now, after taking that individual back or having that individual go back to their former pastor, if the thing cannot be reconciled, then maybe they can be taken in and, and, and ministered to. But the Bible's very clear. If, in the Old Testament says, if thou see thy neighbor, excuse me, no, 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 excuse me, I do great there. If thou see thy enemies, ox or sheep going astray, thou shalt surely return it unto him. It's called character. That's called lawfulness, that's called righteousness, that's called goodness, that's called truth, that's of God. If you are profiting off of somebody else's tragedy, you're a parasite. God's purpose in life is to heal the wounded. Mend the brokenhearted. You can't do that with corruption.
Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is now of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from thence. The king is in abeyance, and he's coming back. Now, I am hungering to see him and meet him. I could care less about the tribulation. I mean, it's that I know he's coming before the tribulation, so I'm seeing the signs of the tribulation. I have no interest or desire for the woeful day for people to be destroyed. But boy, I am hungering for the Lord to come back and rescue me out of this world. I am looking for heaven. And I'm looking for him to come to this earth and set up a kingdom where I'll have, I will not be in a republic. I will not be in a democracy. I will not be under anarchy. I will not be under an oligarchy. But I will be under a king of pure righteousness. Is that what you want? If you are a saved, born again Christian, that's what you should want. Your heart should be panning for the Lord as the heart panneth for the water brooks. And it should be crying out, even so come Lord Jesus. I want the king back. Bring back the king! Authority without humility is tyranny. The centurion answered, said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. But to my servant, Do this, and he doth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. When the Lord Jesus Christ found a lost heathen man that understood authority, he said he found faith greater than that in all of Israel. You know what your Savior is? He's the Almighty God. He's the creator of the universe. He is the absolute and final authority. And when he was on this earth, he spake as one having authority. Failure to submit to godly authority brings anarchy and rebellion. The Bible says that the pastor is not to be a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall in the condemnation of the devil. I brought that verse forward because it, so it would fit in here, while we're, and we'll get to it too. Since a novice is not to become a pastor until he becomes experienced by life trials and testings, he should seek the humility of service as a deacon where he may be proved in obedience to the Lord. Now, here's another thing. You want to talk about a backwards, reprobate, demented, twisted church body today? It says, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. A deacon in a church is not an authority over a pastor. A group of deacons is not an authority over a pastor. The only thing that's an authority over a pastor is the word of God. You will not find a deacon board in the Bible. The only time you'll find a board in the Bible is after a shipwreck and somebody jumps on the board to survive. When a deacon thinks that he's an authority over the pastor, he is a reprobate, he is wicked as hell, and he doesn't deserve and shouldn't be a servant anymore because the whole purpose of getting deacons was to minister to the needs of of the people of the church in servitude. And he needs to do it and, and be found blameless. A deacon is to be serving obedient member of his local church 
so as to prove his obedience to Jesus Christ to serve him in humility. He is to be a yes man. Oh, that bothers the pride of man, doesn't it? Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. You know what every prophet was? God's yes man. You know what every true preacher is? God's yes man. God said it, that settles it. Don't matter whether I believe it or you believe it. God said it, that's it. Yes, sir. How high, sir? That's an abomination to most Christians today. That's the revelation of God's word. Colossians 3.22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but in signalness of heart, fearing God. You know what's wrong today in the body of Christ, in the, in the church? There's no fear of God. And whatsoever you do, do it hardly as unto the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. You're a saved, born again Christian, you do wrong. You're going to pay for it in this life or the life to come. But you're going to pay for it. You're going to have a heavenly father that's going to discipline you. The wisdom of God requires that before a man becomes a pastor, he must first grow in the Lord Jesus Christ to become an elder with experience in humility of obedience through injury. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle. Watch this but also to the forward. Now, you know what people are pulling today? Well, uh, you're not right, so I don't have to be right. Two wrongs never made one right. If your boss ain't right, you're still responsible to do right. If you're the boss and your employees don't do right, you're still responsible to do right. God holds every man, woman, child responsible for personal righteousness. And somebody else's sin is no excuse for you or for me or for anybody else to sin. And if you think it is, you're nuts. And you're, you're, you're confused. Because that's what God calls sin, confusion. And God will deal with you. Especially if you're saved, he's going to deal with you more likely in this life because he scourges every one of his children. If God doesn't scourge you in this life, it's more likely that you're not saved, you're going to hell. Now, I don't know about you, but my father's whipped me a number of times. And I didn't like it at all when I got it, but I like him in hindsight because I said, okay, I know I'm saved because God got me good. He didn't let me get away with my sins. And not only that, caused me to grow up. Caused me to change my ways. Now, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the forward. No Christian. This is what they pull in the churches. Well, the pastor, he wasn't right. There's something wrong with the pastor. In fact, what I've heard is, well, the pastor's in sin. I don't know what it is. We're not going to tell you what it is because we're not going to speak evil. We're just going to put it in your mind that he's in sin. Okay, what sin? You say, I'd like to know because if I'm in sin, I want to repent and get forgiveness. So if you see me in sin, it's your obligation to come and tell me, Pastor, I believe you're in sin. And then show me in the Bible where I'm in sin.
and do it in the spirit of meekness. But don't go around telling people I'm in sin and, and implanting and putting an imagination into their mind and heart that can be unlimited. Like, wow, I wonder what sin. Must be an awful, terrible sin for him to say he's in sin and not to say what the sin is. It must be awful sin. Oh, the devil works pastors over good. Now, you want some rationality? I'm 63 years old. I spend almost all my time taking care of my wife, studying my Bible, and, and trying to prepare uh, DVDs. <laughs> I don't have much sin in that life, folks. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you, but uh, I'm not at the bar, and, uh, you know, I'm not robbing banks, and... Uh, I know I'm a natural man, and I know I'm a sinner, and I got some sin thoughts in my heart and mind sometimes, but uh, excuse me, uh, I'm not committing too much of any sins these days. I don't know. Is it a sin to wash, take your wife and give her a bath? Is it a sin to uh, pick her up and carry her around and put her in bed and, and to take care and, and, and vacuum the house? And, uh, you know, is it a sin to go to church and preach and teach the truth of God's word? If that's sin, then I'm in sin. But if you want to hit me for being in some kind of sin, I'd sure like to know about it. Because you say, what would you do if you were really in sin, Pastor? Here's what I'd do. Father, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. I'll try not to do it again. Thank you for your mercy. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, forgive us of our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now then, a bishop then is a spiritual superintendent, a ruler or director, as applied in the ministry and the service of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a shepherd to a flock of sheep. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned on the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Now that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and what a pastor is, is an under-shepherd. He is a mortal man, and no God to which both he and his flock would be wise to consider and understand. Yet he is to shepherd the flock in the words of God, as Ulihu was found of in Job in God's stead. Elihu addressed Job in his trials. He said, Behold, I am according to thy wishes in God's stead. I also, watch, am formed out of clay. So any spiritual leader is a man and no God. Therefore, he is to have spiritual governance over the people of God in the local church, while each Christian is to follow and obey the Lord Jesus Christ in their personal life. The Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Pastoring the flock of God today, and I know this is true with uh, many pastors, is often filled with great grief because the lack of respect for godly authority is almost non-existence in the culture of our time. Uh, as Rodney Dangerfield used to say, I get no respect. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. I mean, almost every pastor I know of today is grieving. Great grieving. Because they are being continually hurt by their church membership. 
This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despiser of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. They put on a show. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. They don't even know who he is. I declare prosperity for you. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross. There's something different there. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? Oh, there's a cross for all to bear and there's a cross for me. Wonder why they don't like the old hymns anymore. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. A gospel ministry is about truth. Not your truth. Not Shirley McLean's truth. Not Barack Obama's truth. But God's truth. And it's the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Now let me ask you a question. I'm going to just use, give you a little example. Give you some things to think about. Just current events. If you got in an altercation with an individual, you, you got in a tough blow-to-blow -blow fight, and you know the women are fighting these days too, so ladies, you think of you squaring off with another lady that's trying to beat your head into the ground, okay? And you used a choke code to subdue the individual so they'd stop pummeling you. And so you subdued them. And then after a period of about 10 or 15 minutes, that person... Uh, suffered and died a heart attack. Would you believe that you are responsible for their death? Should you go to the gallows because you were just defending yourself? Now, what you see on the world here is this fella that's resisting arrest that had been arrested 31 times previous to that. And then the police take him down. And then 15 minutes later, due to his illnesses and the, and the whole thing, I don't know what, he dies of a heart attack in an ambulance. Now, I submit to you that he's totally responsible for his own death because he resisted arrest. He had no respect for authority. Now, I say, yeah, but the cop was abusive. Maybe so. And maybe the cop needs to be disciplined for abuse. But is the cop guilty of murder? It is his responsibility to apprehend. Now, if he does it in an unwise manner, if he does it against uh, policy, then he's, he's, uh, he should be held responsible for those things, should he not? But you see, that all needs to be decided by a jury with all the facts, with all the evidence. Not just by a very bad-looking video. Because yes, in the video, the police officer looked to go excessive and may well have but here's the thing that everybody's dropping the fact of this if the man had not resisted arrest they would have just put the handcuffs on him and they would have just put him in the car 
they would have drove him down to the station, they would have got his lawyer, or they would have paid for a lawyer for him, and he'd been out on bail, and he'd been home that night eating chicken. Or ribs. Or spaghetti. You know what the Bible says? Truth is falling in the streets. Now that's the one, that one. The other one that took place, that boy got just what he deserved. He robbed the store. He roughed up and intimidated the store owner. He walked down the street, in the middle of the street, boldly. He attacked a police officer in his car, tried to take his gun from him. They lied about what happened. The evidence and the, uh, and the eyewitnesses that saw the whole thing and the phrenic evidence all said it was not the way his buddy lied about it. And where anybody losing their life is a tragedy, you resist authority. God's word, policemen, simply a pastor just warning you to do right, it's your problem if you get hurt. It's your responsibility. Now here's what I deal with. Is a, boy, I tell you, I deal over the years in ministry, years, people are flaky. People come to me, they think I'm a priest. I am a priest, but not in that sense that they think I am. You're a priest too. They come to me and say, Pastor, I'm just being uh, simple here. Can I rob the bank? I'm broke. I need some money. And it's like, no, the Bible says thou shalt not steal. And it's like they want me to give them absolution to sin. And that's a crooked system. I don't give anybody absolution to sin. I tell you what, I teach you what the Bible teaches, and that's up to you to do what you're going to do, and you face the consequences. So you come to me and say, now, Pastor, is there any time an excuse that I can get away with to uh, justify stealing? No. Well, I'm going to steal anyways. Have a nice day. God bless. I guess. I'm not going to arrest you. I'm not that authority. I'm only a spiritual authority. I told you what God's word says. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not say things about another person. That aren't true. And you know, in the Bible, you're not supposed to say another thing about an elder unless there was two or three witnesses that saw it together in unison. In other words, before an elder, an elder is never to have to suffer just one person making a charge against them. It's supposed to be two or three people say, well, we saw you sinning. And they should be able to tell you what the sin is, where you were, and what you did. Or they're in sin. Against an elder, receive not. That's what the Bible says. We do believe the Bible, don't we? All right, now here's where you get yourself in trouble. For what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And what measure ye meet, it should be measured to you again. Or, as it says, be sure your sins will find you out. Or, it says, whatsoever man soweth, that also shall he reap. It comes. It's just what people miss is it comes in God's time choosing. You may think you got away with something for a long period of time. I have a pastor friend of mine who's had an individual turn on him and cost him his pastorate and ministry. Hurt him, devastated him. It took seven years. And he just called me and told me, because I was going to go with him to the trial, because the guy got arrested for child pornography and what he told me was the judge said all the same things that he falsely said against the pastor to this individual he said to him you're a pastor 
we hold you to a higher standard. He said, this is, you own this. He said, what was that? Seven years later, God got him. We had another pastor that um, took over a church, told the people he was a Bible believer. Then when he got in the church, he stopped believing the Bible and started using various versions and uh, brought in uh, wicked music. And then they found uh, pictures of a girl on a cell phone, and he's in prison. Oh, be sure your sins will find you out. It's just that it may not fall tonight. Um, it'll come in God's time. And if you do commit the perfect crime here, it'll come out the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne judgment. Saved or lost, we will all give account to God in this life and in the life to come. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. Notice that this is a judgment seat for God's people. It does not have an eternal condemnation. It has a judgment for the deeds done, but it says, knowing the terror of the Lord. Note that. God takes seriously what none of his saints almost, how the end of his saints are taken seriously today. Sin. What a Christian does in his personal life, he must give account to God for. What he does in his local church setting, he must give account to the pastor for. And basically, that is to attend the church, led services, events, and decency and order. My authority is simply the word of God, preaching and teaching of it, and maintaining decency and order. And if you come into the church and you misbehave, I'm going to speak to you to correct it. And if you don't correct it, I'm going to have to eventually, uh, the thing worst of all I want to do is to eject you. Tell you, well, you can't come if you're not going to behave. And other than that, I'm not interested in messing with anybody's life. My job is to preach the gospel, teach you the word of God. I'm not coming to your house and check out your refrigerator for beer, cigarettes, and sangria. That's God's job and your job to deal with yourself. And that's the way it should be with any pastor. That's not personal. That's the pastor's limit to his authority. You see right here. These things speak and exhort with all re uh, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. A pastor's responsibility is not to control what men and women do in their personal lives, but to exhort them to serve and obey their Lord and Savior in all aspects of their personal lives. Real simple here. Back to the true head of the church. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? The pastor's responsibility is to feed the flock with the manna of God's word. And when the sheep desire the leeks and garlic of the world, they would be wise to examine themselves to see if they're in the faith. Now that you can take it in two senses. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except to be reprobate. If you really know for sure you're saved and the Holy Spirit has confirmed your salvation, which he will if you are, then you need to examine yourself if you're walking in the spirit, if you're walking in the faith. But if you're doubting your salvation and you're living like the devil, uh, maybe you ought to examine if you truly repented of your sins and trusted Christ as your savior and are in the faith. And then go to the Bible and get assurance. The worldly desire to grow in wealth and numbers has wonderfully destroyed the body of Jesus Christ, transitioning us from the church age of Philadelphia, which was brotherly love, to Laodicea, rights of the people, and the nearing of the Lord's return in judgment. So what you're dealing with, perverse disputed men of corrupt minds and destitute of, there we go again, the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And that's why people are stealing other members' sheep and taking advantage of situations, and they're defiling themselves today. And that's why the church is in such a mess. Because they've deceived themselves at thinking with corrupt minds, gain is godliness. 
A pastor's responsibility is to preach and teach the word of God and so to glorify God. And again, the word of humility is a pastor. So you're exhorted. Now watch this. Remember them which have the rule over you. That would be pastors, evangelists that come in and preach, and other who have spoken unto you the word of God, watch, whose faith follow. Considering the end of their conversation, now look what it says. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. Now men are big into change. You see, the world, the flesh, the devil, being sinful and imperfect, always seek change, desiring change and demand change, because their ways always trouble them. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. They always need something new. They seek an elusive peace that they cannot find in the flesh, the world, or the devil. There's no peace there. Their throat is an open sepulcher, and with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of ash is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. It is always wrong to seek change in the church to accommodate the sheep or the world. Which I command your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace saying, Obey my voice. And do them according to all which I command you, so shall ye be my people, and I will be your God. Justly and righteously is peace withheld from the wicked. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. The first and foremost requirement of a pastor, bishop, and overseer is to be faithful to God and his word. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. A pastor's responsibility is not gain, but faithfulness. Faithfulness to the word, faithfulness and truth, faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness. As a Christian, your first responsibility is faithfulness to God. Now, Here's one of the big issues today hitting all the churches. The music of the church is set by God's word and not by the desire of man or the preference of the pastor or the sheep. The Psalms, all 150, may be sung by the church, a cappella or accompanied by melodious, mol, 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 <laughs> melody, I'll just say melody, mol, Melodious. Who said that? That was it. Melodious. Good. Speaking to yourselves, watch, in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Okay? Psalms. The law of the Lord. George, you want to sing that? It's perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord. I can't sing well, but that's your psalms. You got 150 of them. They have to be sung a cappella or with accompanying music, uh, instruments that are melodious. Melodies in all Christian music must praise God with a joyful and thankful disposition, ascribing to God the glory due his name. You see, he says, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worse of the Lord and the beauty of holiness. Now, what's a melody? A melody is an agreeable succession of sounds, a succession of sounds so regulated and modulated as to please the ear. To constitute melody, the sounds must be arranged according, watch this, to the laws of rhythms, measures, or the due proportion of the movements to each other. Melody differs from harmony as it consists in the agreeable succession and modulation of sounds by a singular voice, whereas harmony consists in the accordance of different voices or sounds. So, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now, a hymn is an ode in honor of God. A hymn among Christians is a short poem composed for religious service 
or a song of joy and praise to God. The word primarily expresses the tune, but it is used for the ode or poem, to praise in song, to worship by singing hymns. So one of the great hymns, one of the best, as far as I'm concerned, Christ the Lord is risen today, alleluia. Songs of men and angels say, all right? And then spiritual songs. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown in the sea. A spiritual song, in general, is that which is sung or uttered with musical modulations of the voice. It is a little poem to be sung or uttered with musical modulations, a ballad, which is a solemn song of praise telling a spiritual story. And so, one of the great real story ones, into the debt where a gypsy boy lay, dying alone at the close of the day. News of salvation we carried, said he, nobody ever has told it to me. Tell it again, tell it again. Salvation story, repeat o'er and o'er, till none can say of the children of men, nobody ever has told me before. Did he so love me, a poor little boy? Send down to me the good tidings of joy? Need I not perish? My hand will he hold? Nobody ever, uh, ever the story has told. And so the church is restrained by God to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in melody. If it's out of melody, if it's not a spiritual song telling a story, a ballad of godly things, if it's not the Psalms glorifying and praising God or hymns that men write glorifying and praising God, contemporary Christian music almost to the full cannot meet the requirements of Scripture. And you got a church that's demanding. Well, you know, the strangest thing happened. I, I can't believe some of the strange things that happened to me. I'm doing this Bible study and everything. And I hit my return. And it takes me over to YouTube. And it hits this Christian song of contemporary music. It was like wild. Like, how could this happen? And so I started to listen to the song. And it was pretty. And um, it was um, started off with the tune of Little Surfer Girl. You know? And, uh, but it was a Christian song. And then it uh, went to The Lion Sleeps Tonight. <laughs> And I thought, oh. Now, here's what everybody misses. And we'll close with this. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee. In the day that thou was created, Satan was the music master of heaven. Satan knows music. Many have said something to the fact of, let me sing the songs and I don't care what the laws are. There's a lot of truth to that. Music is a universal language. And for God, he only accepts psalms, hymns and spiritual songs and all these contemporary and backbeat and uh, I don't know all the terms of music are rejected of God that are being demanded by the church. Now, as a faithful pastor submitted to the scriptures, I'm not going to allow any music in this church that isn't God glorifying, God edifying and fits God's scriptures. And there's a lot of, number of people that are very upset with me over this because they wanted their feel-good music. And um, it's not about you feeling good, it's about glorifying God. Now that should make you feel good. Any questions? That's what God's word teaches, if you care what God's word teaches. I do. 
I am not subject to my opinion. Now, I'll give you this. To, you, you've got your liberty, but you don't have the right to bring your liberty into, into the fellowship of God's people. And I say this. I listen on one of my records. I've got In My Father's House for Many Mansions sung by Elvis. It's very nice. It's worldly of the sound, it's, but it's pretty. And I listen to it. I like it. I would never play it in this church unless I used it as an illustration to show you what not to play in the church.